I should say a little something about my motivations, uh, because a lot of you do know me as somebody who has defended emergence, and it may seem like I am switching horses, but it, it's not true, as hopefully will be clear at the end. My defense of emergence was really always motivated by the following things. One, that there ought to be a story about the mental that is neither reductionist or limitivist, or doesn't somehow sneaks it in as fundamental. Whether you sneak it in at the level of strings or atoms or whatever, that there ought, there ought to be some story to be told like that. That two, that what we do as a metaphysician should hook up with science somehow. Dave said as much as well yesterday. Um, and three, that when you encounter something like the hard problem, you must have really screwed up metaphysically somewhere. You made some odious assumption. And you should go back and try to find out what it is. So that plus what you see on the screen, this quotation from Mach, who uh, I would bill as a neutral monist. Um, and uh, like Mach, my other motivation is I want a unified account of reality. So I, I want some real explanatory connection between the mental, the physical, and so on. And I promise you I really will get to metaphysics, but it's going to take me a few slides. So. Hang on there. Here's what I'm going to do. So uh, where does the hard problem come from? Well, uh, again, Dave said this yesterday. You need the background of materialism to get the hard problem off the ground. I, I may have fudged that a little, but I think that's essentially what you said. I, I may have fudged it a little. OK, OK. Um, so I, I think that's right. I think that, in, at least in certain brands of materialism or physicalism, is where we've made the mistake. In particular, the way that plays out in science, it's computationalism on the side of cognitive science, on the side of the cognitive neuroscience of consciousness. It's this story about neural correlates. I want to challenge all that. So uh, I'll tell a story about why I think that gets us into trouble and what the alternative is. That's what the talk is about. But, I, I, so, but I'm going to be drawing from these traditions, neutral monism, ecological psychology, radical empiricism, and phenomenology. Obviously, these thinkers say very different things. There's a lot of stuff going on in these traditions. But this is essentially where I'll be stealing from and synthesizing or uh, misappropriating, some of you might think. So computationalism, H how does the problem arise here? It makes it seem as if there are two mind-body problems, content and phenomenology. So the intuition is that metal and plastic can have content but not consciousness. What are the standard solutions? Reduce phenomenology to intentionality. We've all heard these stories. Reduce intentionality to phenomenology and live with qualia, which is essentially phenomenology minus content or intentionality. None of those strike me as very good solutions for all the standard reasons. But what if we're not computationalists? Then at least we don't, we're not forced to the intuition that phenomenology and content are separate. So right away, you can see this is the sort of thing that many phenomenologists say, uh, extended consciousness people, and so on. So famous quote, there is no computation without representation. So if we buy into some anti-representationalist brand of cognitive science, I call it extended cognitive science, um, we, can, we can go a different direction. And I can't spend a lot of time talking about the details here. I can give you citations. But what I mean by extended cognitive science is not wide computationalism, for example, but the following. That in extended cognitive science, we should think about, so this is basically cognitive science as rooted in dynamical systems theory. We should think about uh, non-linearly coupled animal environment systems, that they form one system. So this is like a cheesy thing from you know, Randy Beer. But this is obviously a toy picture just designed to make the point uh, about what this means. So if we take that seriously, then at least we, we're not forced to say that uh, one portion of the system is representing some, something out there. So extended cognitive science, in the sense that I've defined it, invites anti-representationalism. It doesn't entail it. But it, it gives you at least a way to look for uh, another kind of cognitive science. So 
here's a first approximation to what I mean by extended cognition. It's embodied. You get features of both the brain and the body are crucial to explaining cognition. It's embedded. Features of the environment are crucial to explaining cognition. And it's extended. Environmental features are part of the cognitive system. All of the above. So this stuff is not just background and it's not just input to the cognitive system. The environment is necessary for cognition. Non-linearly related brain, body, and environment are only jointly sufficient. So the idea here is you should understand phenomenology and cognition as inseparable aspects of these brain, body, environment systems. So as with cognition, non-linearly related brain, body, and environment are individually necessary and only jointly sufficient for phenomenology. Obviously, this is a rejection of the neural correlates of consciousness picture. It's a rejection of brain centrism. Yes, brains are really important. Yes, you have to have them, but they are not the whole story. Obviously, that is a big bite for many people to swallow. People of all stripes, of amazingly different metaphysical views, uh, all seem, you heard Searle say it today, it's one of the things he said, you can't even question, we know it's true, it's all about the brain. Well, I think that's wrong. Obviously, the sort of story I'm telling here is compatible with ecological and active and dynamical accounts of cognitive science. Now, let me try to flesh this out a little more. Here's a diagram of an extended phenomenological cognitive system. And again, I, I could spend a lot of time just talking about this, but obviously I don't have it. But you can follow the arrows. But the idea is that the entire system, including the environment as experience, is required to account for phenomenology and cognition. So you have the central nervous system, you have the environment characterized in terms of a niche, you have the perception action cycle, and you have these autopoetic, self-organizing type relationships. And the idea here is that the niche is the environment is experienced. In other words, it's not just some objective physical environment from a God's eye point of view. It's the phenomenological environment. And obviously, as other people have pointed out in their talks, that's going to be different for different critters, even though they all, in some sense, live in the same world. And, and the point here is that this system is designed to reinforce and maintain the niche and its affordances. So think about niche construction, but over much shorter time scales. And also think about it phenomenologically and not merely biologically. And so in order to maintain these structures, this, this one uh, environmental organism system, different resources, bodily, neural, environmental, and so on, are at different points in time going to be brought to bear. So using the language of dynamical systems theory, the ongoing activity of a robust uh, you know, environmental cog phenomenological cognitive system acts as a higher order constraint which enslaves the components necessary to maintain its dynamics. So this is a kind of emergence. I would call it contextual emergence. So they, we're talking about very plastic boundaries here that allow these systems to maintain their robustness and their plasticity. So right away, if you take this view seriously, you can check off the problem of intentionality. Because the world is inseparable from the mode of apprehension. Intentionality is not, contingent, is not a contingent feature of conscious experience. So again, this is the sort of view you get from ecological psych people, phenomenologists, and so on. So let's try to draw a conclusion before we get to the metaphysics. To whatever extent mature cognitive science takes cognitive science to be as I've described them, Cognition should be seen as a feature of these wide brain, body, environment systems. Cognition and phenomenology can be seen as inseparable. Phenomenology can, can be seen as a feature of these systems. And maybe we can get out of the rut 
of our standard discussions about consciousness. Well, hold on a second. What we've done then is we've gotten rid of qualia, right? The way that I define qualia. So you no longer have to believe in these, you know, this subtract the intentionality out and there's these exper experiential tropes left over. But there's still the problem of subjectivity, as Gallagher and Zavahavi point out. So the hard problem does not disappear if one rightfully denies the existence of qualia and if one, so to speak, relocates the phenomenal outside rather than inside. The hard problem is not about, is not about the existence of non-physical objects of experience, but the very existence of subjective experience itself. It is about the very fact that objects are given to us. OK, good. So we got rid of qualia, but we still have subjectivity. So. Here, affording neutral monism, I want to say that these extended phenomenological cognitive systems, extended dynamical cognitive science, and neutral monism go hand in hand. So again, Gibson, an affordance is neither an objective property nor a subjective property, or it is both, if you like. An affordance cuts across the dichotomy of subjective, objective, and helps us to understand its inadequacy. It is equally a fact of the environment and a fact of behavior. It is both physical and psychical, yet neither. An affordance points both ways to the environment and to the observer. And I want to say that is precisely the idea of neutral monism, at least as people like James discussed it. And it'll be clear in a minute that that doesn't, at least as far as I can see, entail any sort of panpsychism. So the hard problem is accounting for subjectivity in a world of physical objects. And the way that I conceive of James, at least the way that I conceive of neutral monism, is it's uh, a denial of the fundamental distinction between subjectivity and objectivity or between the mental and the physical. I'll say more about that in a second. One mistake that I think a lot of people make, I, especially people who try to connect neutral monism and panpsychism, is they have the intrinsic properties. Uh, so the mental properties are supposed to, you've seen a lot of it already, they're supposed to be the intrinsic properties. I don't see any reason to believe there's any such thing as intrinsic properties, or essences, or, or anything of the sort. So in the brand of neutral monism that I'm selling you, it's relations all the way down. Probably the closest thing I've seen in the literature is something like ontological structural realism. I think that eliminates a lot of problems about interaction. It eliminates a lot of problems about mental versus physical. So I would define neutral monism as follows. Mental and material features are real, but in some specified sense, reducible to or constructible from a neutral basis and a non-eliminative sense of reduction. Neutral basis generally is not conceived as a substance. Again, I reject any substances. Mental and material features are not separable or merely correlated. They are non-dual. That's the key. Uh, indeed, they are not essentially different and distinct aspects. That's what I think neutral monism is really committed to. I think all the panpsychisms I've seen violate that by having these physical properties described in a certain way and then these intrinsic mental properties. So here's James. My thesis is that if we start with the supposition that there's only one primal stuff or material in the world, the stuff of which everything is composed, and if we call that stuff pure experience, the knowing can easily be explained as a particular sort of relation towards one another into which portions of pure experience may enter. The relation itself is a part of pure experience. One of its terms becomes the subject or bearer of the knowledge, the knower, the other becomes the object known. A quote that everyone has seen. So I understand that the language of pure experience makes you think it's just phenomenalism or idealism. But I mean, you have to use some language. The fact that that sort of language is used, I don't think, entails that it collapses into one of those sorts of positions. But the idea here is that the knower and the known, at least as I conceive of it, 
they emerge from what he calls pure experience. And it, there should definitely be a better expression, I agree. And I, the way that I think about this is that r you should think about it as a cut between the subject and the object. That there is this pure experience, this field, for lack of, again, for lack of a better word, and a cut is made between the subject and the object. That cut creates this sense of an inner, outer, a physical, mental, a subject and object, but, and, and it, I, I wouldn't want to say that that cut is an illusion in the sense that it's not real, but the cut is what leads us to incorrectly make these false dichotomies. A given undivided portion of experience taken in one context of associates plays the part of the knower or a state of mind or consciousness, while in a different context, the same undivided bit of experience plays the part of the thing, known, of an objective content. In a word, in one group it figures as a thought, in another group as a thing. So, understandably, we tend to think of thoughts as internal, mental, and then here I am on this side of my head, and out there is the external physical world. But I want to say that this subject-object cut is what leads us to, to that sort of view. That you should think about it as one field. You want to call it experience, you want to call it a more neutral term, that's fine. So I would say that the environment, the body, and the brain emerge from or are derived from these sorts of systems. They're not the fundamentals. The relations are fundamental. So we don't have to worry about how these brute substances or these individuals, how they relate to one another, how they can be causally related. I think a lot of those problems, like mental causation, and the, and the physical mental problem and all that are the problem of creating, of assuming that these dichotomies are as they seem to be. So if you take this seriously, it seems to me that we ought to be able to put an end to false dichotomies. The poison of the mind matter, inner outer, subject world, subjective objective, that, that this, this is really the problem. This, this, is, this is where the mind-body problem comes from. And you can see this sort of, these false dichotomies in lots of different views, metaphysical realism, physicalism, those are obvious, but even in phenomenology, and here what I have in mind is the bracketing. So I'm saying take the brackets off and take phenomenology seriously as part of the world, as part of the, yes, the physical world, the mental world, whatever expression that you want to use. And so I'm trying to characterize I'm trying to characterize a view of neutral monism that is totally unlike dualism. It, it is totally unlike any sort of panpsychism. You're not sticking some mental ingredient in as fundamental in some way. But you take seriously that what we normally think of as minds and the external world is all just one field. So I think that the marriage of neutral monism and extended cognitive science deflates the hard problem and bridges the explanatory gap. Neutral monism allows for a unified world in which emergence is both perfectly natural and explanatory. So when we look at explanations in extended cognitive science, it's not just the positing of a bunch of brute bridge laws. And you can start to tell stories about how there's going to be relationships between certain sorts of self-organizing systems and experience. And there's no reason to think that as spooky or brute as long as you buy into this entire package. Thank you.